we kick off this morning, uh, 40 Days in the Word. Today is the first of six messages that I'll be bringing uh, from now until, I guess, sometime into uh, the end of October or so, and uh, on, in our 40 days. Our groups start this week, and, and uh, if you have questions about your group, call your group leader, because they know all the answers, all right, to everything that's going on, and, um, and they know what's, what's going to take place. So you say, well, I haven't got my book yet. You'll get it at your group, okay? You don't need it in advance. All right, now, let's read the scripture. Find 2 Timothy 3, 16, and just follow along with me as I read. It says, all scripture. Let me stop and say, tell me what all means, church. All means all, and that's all all means. All scripture, which means every word in this book from Genesis 1-1 to the very last amen in Revelation, all right? All scripture has a purpose. Its purpose, is, and it says it's God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, for rebuking. That means saying, don't do that. Sometimes we need to be told that, don't we? For correcting. Don't do that, but do this instead. For correcting and training in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God, the people of God, Anybody who belongs to God because of faith in Jesus Christ. This is, our, this is our owner's manual. This is our guidebook. This is what gives us direction. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right? The Bible is the most read book, the best-selling book in all of history, isn't it? And it's the most translated book in history. So this morning, we want to talk about the Bible and ask the question, why is the Bible the Word of God? Why does it make that claim? How do we know it? So we're going to look at that today as we start these 40 days. It says there in that scripture, 2 Timothy 3, that the Bible is, the scriptures are God-breathed. God-breathed comes from two Greek words, theonoustos. Theo meaning God. Noustos means means breath. Um, You're familiar with the word pneumonia comes from the same Greek word. Pneumonia is a disease of the lungs. Theonoustos, God breathed. What does that mean? Some of the translations translate it as as inspired. But we're not talking about inspired in the sense of like, that was an inspiring uh, um, uh, speech I heard. or That's such an inspiring writer, writing an inspiring book. It's not inspiring, it's inspired, meaning it's God breathed. Explain that a little bit better, Rick. Okay, I'll try. Right now you are listening to the breath of Rick Lawrenson. What do you mean? Well, my breath, my voice is simply my breath coming up over my vocal cords, vibrating those vocal cords and coming out as sound. If I didn't have any breath, I wouldn't have any voice. So the breath of Rick Lawrenson is the word of Rick Lawrenson. It's the voice of Rick Lawrenson, and that's what it says about God and his word. The scriptures are his voice. The scriptures are God's very breath. It's, this book is not just pages and pages of good ideas. Right? That's not what it is. As a result of that, Psalm 119, verse 86 tells us all of your, there's that word again, all of your commands are trustworthy, which means everything in the Bible can be trusted as true. Why? You're you're thinking people. Why can it be counted true and trustworthy? Because it comes from? It's one thing for the Bible to claim it's the word of God. It's one thing for the Bible to say it can be trusted, but how do I really know, Rick? How do I know this is the word of God and not just a bunch of fables, not just a bunch of stories that are put together? And I think that's, those are valid, legitimate questions that we need to ask before we ever start studying the Bible. How, can, how do I know I can trust it? So this morning, I want to rapid fire. I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can. I've got a lot of material. I want to share seven reasons why we know we can trust it, right? Number one, we can trust the Bible because it is historically accurate. <clears throat> the Bible isn't just... Well, the Bible's a book full of doctrine, and yes, it is. There's a lot of theology in here, a lot of things that we believe, but the Bible also has a lot of history, doesn't it? In fact, there's a whole section in the Old Testament that we divide off the Old Testament in different sections called the historical books. So it's a lot of history, and it's true 
history. It's accurate regarding doctrine. It's accurate regarding theology and morals and ethics, but it's also true history because it talks about real people who lived in real places in real time. It's true historically. So you say, well, why is that even important? Because the Bible tells us this. God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. A lot of people ask this. Is there anything God can't do? Is there anything my God can't not do? Yeah, you know, there is. There are a lot of things God can't do. God cannot deny himself. God cannot be, God cannot not be God. All right? Uh, Hebrews 6.18 says it's impossible for God to lie because God is truth. So if this book, if this book has one lie in it, just one, one falsehood in it, let's just take it and toss it into fire and burn it. All right? Because if it has one lie in it, it can't be God's book because God cannot lie. Psalm 33, 4 says, The word of the Lord is right and true. And that's not only right and true about salvation, it's right and true about history. Because you see, the Bible is, we have this book and it's primarily a compilation of eyewitness accounts. People who saw these things happen. It's not secondhand, thirdhand, eyewitness accounts. And that's the best kind of history. Moses was there when the Red Sea divided. Joshua was there. We saw this a few weeks ago when the walls of Jericho fell. The disciples of Jesus sat in the upper room and saw the, the uh, resurrected Jesus appear. And then they wrote down what happened and we read about it in this book. Eyewitness accounts. Another proof of history is in archaeology. Archaeology. Uh, one of the greatest examples of that in, is, uh, is an empire that's mentioned in the Bible called the Hittites. Have you heard of the Hittites? You have. If you've read the story of David, and you know David's story with Bathsheba, her husband was a man named Uriah the Hittite. Hittites are mentioned in the Old Testament as a powerful empire. The problem with the Hittites was that for centuries, in fact, until just a little over 100 years ago, for centuries, historians said the Bible made up the Hittites because nobody knew where they were, where they were from, anything about them. Nobody knew about the Hittites other than what it said in the Bible. And then in the early 1900s, a professor by the name of Hugo Winkler discovered at a, at a city, at a, at a place in Turkey, he found 10,000 clay tablets at a capital as they dug it up and discovered the capital of the Hittites. Now everyone believes in the Hittites. Why? Because archaeology says the Bible's true. The Bible is historically true. In fact, during a break today when you go home and you, uh, you're watching your favorite team play, if you do, uh, during the break, during halftime, go on Wikipedia and read about the Hittites. And it will tell you the Bible is historically accurate. Second reason why we can trust the Bible, why we know it's the word of God, is that it is scientifically accurate. We just sang a great song about that. People who think the Bible is scientifically inaccurate, somebody says, well, the Bible isn't scientifically accurate, it tells us two things about them. Number one, they've never studied the Bible, and secondly, they probably don't know science. So God the Creator always sets up the laws of science, and he made sure that his word does not contradict the laws, laws of science. Now, the Bible was not given to be a scientific book. This is not a book of science. I didn't study this in, in science in school, in high school or college. We didn't study the Bible as a science book. That's not its purpose. You don't study the Bible to build a rocket. And the Bible doesn't use scientific language. You won't find the words molecules or atoms in the Bible. Well, primarily because those things weren't really figured out until many centuries later. But you find the laws of science in the Bible. And the Bible never gives bad science. In fact, it's always way ahead of science. There are things in the Bible that the Bible says, and, and speaking to science, the Bible says that we're not discovered by scientists, by, by mankind, until the last two or three hundred years. Up until that time, people thought, that's ridiculous. But we've discovered the Bible is true when it speaks about science. The reason it isn't, it's accurate 
the Bible is, is because the laws, again, of the universe were created by God. And one thing about truth is it never changes. Truth doesn't change. Truth is truth, always will be. But scientific understanding of truth does change. For example, the science book, the earliest year I can remember in elementary school that I had science was fourth grade. Right? I don't know, think I had it earlier than that. Fourth grade. And if I would go back and find a copy of my fourth grade science book, you know what we would discover as we flip through it? Some of the stuff that was in that book is obsolete. For example, we were told there were nine planets in our solar system, and then the last, the farthest one out was a planet by the name of Pluto. Anybody taught that? The kids are told today, no, Pluto's not a planet. Pluto is a moon. Not really a planet on its own, obsolete. For years, science told us, those, those of us adults have been around a little bit, for years, science told us how bad sugar and soft drinks was for us. So they came up with fake sugar. I go into a restaurant sometimes and I sit down at the table and I ask the server, do you have any fake sugar? Right? I want the yellow packet of fake sugar. And so they invented sweeteners and created diet soft drinks. And now here, 25 years later, 30 years, however long it's been, now they're saying, don't drink that. It'll give you cancer. Well, why is that? Because science, old science, some things are obsolete. God understands stuff, even when we don't, and yet his rules never change. The Bible says this in Psalm 148. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord. Why? For he issued his command and they, every created thing, came into being. He established them forever and ever and his orders will never be revoked. So things like scientific laws, like the second law of thermodynamics, things like that, uh, they work today and they work tomorrow. It's not like they're obsolete. They will always be true. Always works. Why? Because it was true and made by God. Because God's truth does not change. The scientific world believed that the world was flat. You heard, read that and learned that in your history class in elementary school when they talked about the Europeans coming over here and they were afraid they would sail so far from the European continent and then fall off the end of the world because they thought the world was flat like a tabletop. And that was just 500 years ago that they thought that. But the Bible says the exact opposite. 2,600 years ago, God said this in Isaiah 40, verse 22. The word of God says, God is enthroned above, look at this, above the sphere of the earth. Way back in the Old Testament, God said the earth is round. How did they miss it? And they must not have spent much time studying, don't you think? The earth is a sphere. The earth is a globe. The Bible tells us so. Yet science, for hundreds and hundreds, I guess thousands of years, ignored that and didn't believe it. But God said it was true, whether anybody believed it or not. And that's the truth about God's true truth. Whether people believe it or not, it's still the truth. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, verse 5, five every word of God is flawless. It's not only flawless, Psalm 12, 6 says, the words of the Lord are flawless like silver refined in a furnace of clay and purified seven times to get all the impurities out. Flawless, this book. Number three reason why we can trust the Bible. Because the Bible is prophetically accurate. That means that the predictions made in the Bible always come true. The Bible's filled with prophecies where God says, oftentimes through a prophet, through a man, through a woman, God says, this is going to happen at such and such a time in such and such a way. The Old Testament had lots and lots of these prophecies, especially. Over all the centuries, most of these prophecies have already been filled, every one of them exactly as God said. And there are some that are still yet to be fulfilled. We're going to be coming up on the Christmas season before long. In fact, if you go in Walmart, you might think it already is Christmas. <clears throat> there are over 300 prophecies in the Bible about Jesus. 
the Messiah, that were given up to a thousand years before he was born. Over 300. And they said things like, this is where he'll be born, and, and uh, this is when he'll be born. This is how he'll be born. You know, you can't control that if you're trying to make yourself the Messiah. You can't control those kind of things that happened that were said thousands of years, hundreds of years before you were born. You didn't choose. Anybody here? Tell me if you did. Did you choose where you were born? No, of course not. Did you choose who your mother would be? Your father? None of us did. Did you choose how you would die and that choice was made hundreds and hundreds of years before it would happen? This is how he'll die. This is the manner he'll die and what he'll die from. Again, over 300 prophecies. David, David's words show and spell out in the Psalms that Jesus would be crucified. He doesn't use the word crucifixion. Why? Because that was a Greek thing that had not been yet, yet been invented when David was alive. But you read... And David write about the wounds in his hands and his feet and so forth. And he's describing something that David had no clue what he was writing about. But it came from God because it was inspired by God, breathed by God into David's heart to write. What are the odds of me making 300 predictions about you and every one of them coming true? What are the odds? It takes more faith to believe it was all just coincidence than to believe that God planned it. Somebody says, I don't believe in God. I don't have any faith, uh, but I, I'm an atheist. Wow, you got, you've got more faith than I do. It takes enormous, a faith, enormous amount of faith to believe it's all just random and that it just happened without a design or without a creator. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1.21, no prophecy ever originated from humans. Instead, it was given by the Holy Spirit as humans spoke under God's Direction. In fact, if a man came up with his own prophecy and said, I'm going to make this up and say, this is thus saith the Lord, and this is what God is, that's why, please don't listen to modern day prophets. Right? I haven't heard the last time somebody was stoned to death because they prophesied something that was going to happen and it didn't happen. No, we, we kind of go, oh, they got it wrong. In the Old Testament, in the Bible, they had to be correct 100% of the time because if you were wrong just once, you're considered a false prophet and they would put you to death. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 56, but all this is happening, him, him being here on the earth while he was there, all this is happening to fulfill the words of the prophets, talking about the Old Testament prophets that wrote about him hundreds and thousands of years before he came. All this is happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. Jesus said it's all coming true just like God predicted Number four, reason. It's thematically unified. That's not a word I use in my everyday vocabulary. Thematically, what does that mean? It means, simply means this. It has the same theme running through the entire book from cover to cover. It has the same theme. This book was written over a period of 1,600 years, from the first book to the last. Listen to this. By 40 different human authors. Over 1,600 years, by 40 different human authors who lived on three different continents and spoke and wrote in three different languages. And most of them, you think about it, period of 1,600 years, most of them didn't know each other. They couldn't get on the phone and call and say, okay, here's what I wrote, what did you write? Let's compare notes. They didn't know each other. They didn't get together and have a committee and say, and said, let's write the word of God. Let's make sure that, we've all, that we all agree. They couldn't do that. How do you think they all got the same story then? How do they all get this book to be thematically unified like it is? How do you think they knew what they wrote? It would be different if just one person wrote this book. This, per, this book was written by poets, by prophets, by princes, by kings, by sailors, by soldiers, by common people, by educated people. Some of the Bible was written in a cave. Some of the Bible was written on ships. 
Some of it was written, some of it was written in homes, some of it written in palaces, some of it written in prisons. And yet it all comes, all 66 of these books by these 40 different authors come up with the same theme. Someone years ago described that theme as they called it the scarlet thread that's woven through the Bible. And the theme of the Bible is the whole word of God points to one person, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus understood this. We're told in Luke 24, 27, he said, beginning with Moses, why beginning with Moses? Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. We call those five books the Pentateuch. Pent, you know, you have Pentagon, a five-sided building. The Pentateuch, the five books that Moses penned, that Moses authored, beginning with Genesis. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in, the, in all the scriptures concerning himself. He knew this whole book is about him. Jesus was the only one then that, that can legitimate, legitimately before God say, it's all about me. Because it was. This story, this book is about Jesus from beginning to end. And you find him not only in creation, speaking the world and the universe into existence, but you find what he would do when he would come in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned and God shed the blood of an animal to get the skins to cover their nakedness. That's a picture of what God would do to cover our sin thousands of years later. It all began with Jesus. It's about Jesus, this book, from beginning to end. The pictures in the Bible, and I'm, when I say pictures in the Bible, I'm not talking about if you have a, a child's Bible you know, the, with pictures in it. But I mean the, the stories, you know, the, the, the pictures that are in the stories, the metaphors, the analogies, the allusions, everything in Scripture from beginning to end. It's about God's plan to redeem people and build a family for eternity. That's what it's all about. That's why we're here. And it all began with him, and you can see him in every book. Number five, we can trust the Bible to be the word of God because it was confirmed by Jesus. It was confirmed by Jesus. Jesus trusted the Bible. Now let's stop and think about that for a minute. You may have heard somebody say, you may have even thought yourself, well, I trust what Jesus said. I'm just not sure, so sure about these other guys. I was actually in a, in a church, in a Baptist church, not too far from here one Sunday. Gail was with me. And uh, we, we went to this church, this is before I came here as pastor, and uh, sitting in church, and I heard the pastor of that church say, as he read the scripture, and he, and he said, now, these words are in red which means Jesus said them so we know they really are the word of God. And I looked at her and I said, did he just say that? And he did. You may have heard somebody say that. Well, I'll trust what Jesus said, but I'm not so sure about what Daniel said or what Moses said or Jonah. Come on. Here's the challenge to that. The challenge is this. By his words, Jesus said he trusted the rest of the Bible. So if I, you're, you're thinking people here, you think logically. If I trust Jesus, do you trust Jesus? If I trust Jesus, then I have to trust the rest of the Bible, all the Bible. If I don't trust the Bible, then what am I saying to Jesus? You're not really that trustworthy because Jesus said I can trust the Bible. Jesus proclaimed the Bible, and he said it was a unique book among, above all others. Matthew 5, 18, he said, I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen. Those of you who grew up like with me on the King James, not one jot or tittle. Those are Hebrew things in their alphabet and the way they wrote. Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus said, this book then, he said, it's going to last how long? Until the end of time. 
It's going to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in this world. In John 10, 35, Jesus said this. This is pretty simple. If you want to make it simple, he said, Scripture is always true. When Jesus said that every sentence and every word of the Bible is true, that should be enough for you and me to believe it. He believed every single sentence. He believed every single word. He said, I believe every dotting of every I and every crossing of every T. As the old preachers would say, I believe the Bible from cover to cover. I even believe when it says Holy Bible on the cover. You know. Jesus said, Luke 11, 28. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. He believed Jesus did in the prophets. He believed in the miracles. He believed in Adam and Eve because he talked about them. He believed in the tragedy of Sodom and Gomorrah because he talked about it. He believed in Jonah being swallowed by the fish because he talked about it. He even said, just as Jonah was in the belly of that fish for three days, I'm going to be in the earth for three days. He believed those stories because he talked about them as truth. He believed in it all. So the only conclusion, again, you're thinking people, but the only conclusion you and I can make is if these stories, especially some of these Old Testament stories, Rick, you talked about the parting of the Red Sea, and we, we heard a few weeks ago about the parting of the Jordan River, and we've heard about all these things that happen in these miraculous things of people being in a fiery furnace and not being burned up and being in a lion's den and not being chewed up. We've heard all these stories. The only conclusion we can make is if they're a bunch of fables, then Jesus was a liar. That's the only conclusion we can make. Augustine said, if you believe in the Bible, what you like. If you believe the parts in the Bible that you like and you don't believe what you don't like, it's not the Bible you trust, but yourself. Ooh. Jesus trusted the Bible. Number six, why do we trust the Bible? Because it has survived all attacks. And that makes it an unusual book. The Bible is the most despised book, the most banned book ever in history. They're still trying to get rid of the Bible in parts of the world. People have died because they refused to give up their Bibles. Today, if you were to, on why you would do this, I have no clue, because I'm going to go on vacation. Where are you going to go on vacation? I think I'm going to go to North Korea. And there in your carry-on bag, you've got your Bible. In North Korea, you're going to go to prison for that, and you may not ever come back out. Yet it's still the most read book in the world. Still. It's still the most published book in the world. Still, as I said, the most translated book in the world. It's in more languages than any other book. It's the best-selling book in the world, and it's still making a difference in people's lives. Read Matthew 24, verse 35. Read that with me. Let's read it aloud together. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You see, the only thing that's going to be left on this planet that's going to last is the Word of God. And all the Hitlers in the world, all the Stalins in the world, all the mouths in the world, all the dictators, all those who would try to rid this world of the Bible will never be able to do it. They've tried. Because it's the word of God. It's eternal. And the world's going to burn up, the Bible tells us one day, but the word of God is eternal because truth lasts forever. First Peter, Peter wrote this. He said, the grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. Number seven, we can trust the Bible because it has transforming power. Transforming power. Nothing can change the lives of the Bible, or excuse me, change the lives of people like the Bible. Now, if we had time, I would sit down and I would say, how has the Bible changed your life? And maybe not everybody would stand and give testimony. 
but probably the majority of us could. And some of us would talk on and on and on because of all the transformations, all the changes that the Bible has made in your life. In fact, we see them, we should be seeing those kinds of changes in our lives every single day. And you know what helps make that possible and helps make that happen is when we're in the Bible every single day. You're gonna be asked, I'm gonna just go ahead and ask you now um, to do this. There are different places in this room, on that table there are some, outside by the wooden wall and at our, at our info center out front. There are these pieces of paper that say 40 days in the word covenant. And we're gonna ask you to take one and fill it in and sign it. And uh, we're gonna ask for one of our pastors and they'll be scattered about. And you just grab that pastor and say, would you please sign this for me? And you put the, the church name on it, put the date on it. This is for you to keep. But here's what it says. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And then here's, here's what it says. I commit to living a life transformed by God's word by three things. Over these 40 days, you're committing to these three th things. Number one, reading God's word daily, Matthew 4.4. 4. Putting God's word into action, James 1.22. Memorizing God's word, Proverbs 7, 2, and 3. And if you can make that commitment, then you go ahead, please, and fill one of these out and, uh, and have this, stick this in your Bible, in your purse, whatever, wherever you have it, put it up somewhere on your, put, get one of your refrigerator mag magnets and stick it there on the mirror in your bathroom, something that you see every day as a reminder over the next 40 days, I'm gonna do these three things. Nothing changes the lives of people like the Bible. John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the truth is what? the word of God. You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. The fundamental question, the, the most important question you're gonna ask yourself in life is this. Here's the most important question every single one of us will ask in life. And we start asking this question really when we're children, when we're small. We may not say these very words, but this is what we're asking, this is what we're thinking. And then when we become teenagers, it becomes a very major part of how we think. But the most important question that we'll all, and we still ask this question as adults, by the way. What's that question, Rick? Well, what's gonna be the final authority for my life? What's gonna be the final authority for my life? You need to decide that. And I recommend that you decide that today. And the, you know, you're know, you gonna have to decide, is it gonna be the word of God? Or is it gonna be the word of the world? Am I going to listen to what God says and believe that it's true? Or am I going to listen to public opinion? Am I going to listen to my own set of feelings? What's going to be the authority in my life? Is it going to be God or is it going to be me? This is why things that we've talked about this morning, things like inerrancy and infallibility, which mean the flawlessness of God's word. That's why these things are so important. We are one of those churches, by the way, if you're our guest, we believe the Bible's perfect, all right? Why do we believe it's perfect? Because it's God's word. And again, if it was not perfect, it could not be the word of God. We believe it's God's word, that it's perfect. This book is so important because my salvation, my eternal life, and yours as well, depends on this book being right. Because if it's got something wrong that we miss, who knows what eternity is going to be like for us. This is the book that tells everybody in this room, if you don't listen, to it, listen to this. Because some of you are struggling with this right now. This is, this is the book that tells you that your life is not an accident. That there's purpose for you in this world. That God has an overarching purpose for your life. Now, science doesn't tell you that. This is the book that says, God made you to love you. 
This is the book that says you can be forgiven whatever your sin. This is the book that says your past can be forgiven, that you have a purpose for living, that you can have a home in heaven. This is the book that says no matter what problem you go through, God can use it for good in your life. This is the book that says there is a reason for hope. This book. So we're going to be talking about this book for the next 40 days. You're going to be studying about this book for the next 40 days in your connection groups. All right, I'm going to come back after we sing and talk about a few more things, but let's bow our heads in prayer. I think, God, it's easy for us, especially in this country, where we have such free access to the Bible. I mean, I don't know how many copies of it I own, like a bunch. And, and I have it on my phone, and I have it on my tablet, and I have it on my computer. We have such free access to this Bible that for some reason, Lord, m- many of us, our Bibles sit at home and are covered with dust. I think about, Father, the, the video that I've seen, that many of us have seen, of Christians in China putting their hands for the very first time in their lives on copies of the Word of God. And the joy, the tears. This is a special book. It's special because you breathed it. You inspired it. As these 40 authors over 1,600 years penned these 66 books, Father, your spirit guided their hand and their quill and the scrolls that they wrote. So much more that I could have shared this morning about how special this book is and how history, its, its history is accurate. How they worked so hard to as they copied this book to get every stroke of the pen exactly correct every single time. You've preserved it, Father, because it's truth. It can't be destroyed. And so, Father, we as a church are stopping for these next six weeks and and we're going to focus on it, Lord, so that we can say in a way maybe that we've never been able to say before uh, for all of us, my life is built on the solid foundation of Scripture. And mean it. We get into the habit of learning it, memorizing it, studying it together, discussing it. Help us, God, to fall in love with your word, to learn your word, And ultimately, as Jesus said, to live it, to put it into practice. In your name I pray, amen.